Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those who are not familiar with this two o'clock time in our life, this is People Talk with Paul Lawrence. And, um, you know, it's the 1st of November, so welcome. For those of you who have hung in with me for more or less every week since the original lockdown, uh, we are moving into lockdown to the sequel, I guess. So, um, no big news there. But you know what? I, I like to start the, the, the show with um, a, a bit of a roundup as to what I thought were the big points and the big things from the, the previous week. And um, I don't think there's anything larger this week than yesterday's announcement um, that we're going back into lockdown again. Um, I don't think there's anybody out there who thought this was, a, was any sort of a shock. Yeah, I think that the, the thing about it is how, how poorly, I, I have to continue with this word, how poorly this whole thing has been handled. So you don't have to have been living on the front line to know that less than four weeks ago, Sage, who we're always told are the people who the government are following their advice, recommended a two week, what they call circuit breaker. One of the things that was proposed that, look, do it over the half term. Because if you do it over the half term, you have this great opportunity to really have an effective lockdown because you can even, even keep the young people at home as well to make it as effective as possible. Contrary to what we're told, they did not follow that advice and they opted to do this tiered thing, which Sage kind of told them again, dude, this is not gonna work, but that's what they did anyway. Here we are less than four weeks later and they're going now for a four week lockdown. Now, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an immunologist or anything like that. So I don't know if a two week lockdown would have done the deed. What I do know is that the guys who have the multiple degrees told us that if we didn't do it at the time, we would have to do it eventually. And chances are we'd have to do it for a longer period of time. Here we are. Boat, creek, no paddle. And we just, need, we just need to really center in on the fact that that is why we have so many conspiracy theories attached to what's going on. Whenever there's a vacuum of information or whether there's confusing information, the people will make up their own minds. People will make their own theories. They'll make their own things. I, I think for some people, it is just unbelievable that someone who wanted to lead the country so desperately that he would stab his very, very best friends in the back to do so, could be so actually incompetent at the role he sought. So I don't care your political persuasion, but you can't be telling me right now that you continue with the same level of faith that you may have had at the very beginning. Hey, yeah, he was dealt a rough hand. No one saw COVID coming. But you know what? I even thought this morning that maybe Trump is actually doing a better run at COVID and Boris, because Trump has just said, nah, not interested. Don't want to talk about it. He's not even pretending to make an effort. Well, our guy here, he's pretending to make all this effort. And I've got to tell you, boy, if this was a report card and an old school report card, it would be an F minus. You know, I don't know how you you young people do your report cards now. So that, that, that's been the week. Um, next week, we're going back into lockdown on Thursday. You know, some people are asking why Thursday, why not Tuesday, why not Monday? You know, no bulk, buy some toilet paper, man. You've got some time, you go out and do that and get that done. But what I do know is that irrespective of what's happening there, the world spins on. Yeah, that is the reality of the matter is the world spins on. And as individuals, I think it's time that we really started to understand these two words about individual responsibility, yeah? When there's a lack of leadership, that's what you need, individual responsibility. However, lack of leadership is so far from the conversation we're gonna be having today. The conversation we're gonna be having today is with four gentlemen who, in my humble, nah, nah, not so humble opinion, have demonstrated exceptional leadership. And I am so, so, so pleased that they have taken time out again to come onto my show today. 
I make no apologies for being a lifelong 100 Black Men of London fan. Yeah, I'll tell you the story of how I came, came to be a member. And I'm pleased to say I'm probably still the longest serving member. Yeah. But these four gentlemen who are here with me today are the guys who not just made it possible to start, but more importantly, these are the guys who kept the vision going over the period, uh, period of time that it has. And I'm sure one of the great stories that will come up was when myself and Ken were at an event many, many years ago and the conversation about the 100 black men came into being and someone quipped, an organization led by black men? Nah, that, that won't last five years, yeah? That was the, the, the group of feeling. I think, you know, and Ola will be able to tell us we're on year 22 or something like that. So that five-year-old bet, we should have taken it, Kent. Yeah, <laughs> we should have taken it. That, that's our way of looking at it. As anybody who knows me will tell you, I'm pretty excited about today because my backstory is that I did not grow up in the UK. I didn't have any sort of school links in the UK. So I had no real friends. I didn't have any friends in the UK. Some would say I still don't, but that's cool. But what it meant was that I didn't have a peer group. Yeah, I didn't have a peer group. I didn't have, you know, people from an alumni who were new. I didn't go to college here. The only university I did was late. So when I met these guys from the 100, these guys became my social group. They became my social circle. And that is only because I bumped into a group of guys who were stand-up men, who more importantly wanted to stand up for their community. And through them, we met a group of stand-up women. I'm gonna out Donna Spencer because Donna has been here from the start as well. And I, you know, I should make her a, a nominal president just in case, just in case of anything else. But it's a wonderful group of people. So enough of that. I am going to introduce them as usual. Normally I do it in the order in which they join today, but that's not the order I'm gonna do it today. The way I'm gonna do it today is in the order in which they served as presidents of the 100. And so I'm gonna introduce you first and he'll introduce himself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now, cause we'll get into the whole 100 journey later on. Mr. Ken Barnes. Good afternoon, Paul. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in front of you and, and on your show and, and sharing something that I too am incredibly passionate about. Uh, as you know, I, I mean, I won't get into my story with 100 right now, but hopefully at some point later on, we could get into that. But the 100 has been pivotal in my journey, in my progression as, as not just a man, but as a father, as a friend, it has it's taught me so much. I mean, one of the sayings that I carried with myself at the beginning of the 100 journey was that no man can truly help another without helping himself. And that has been a testament to the journey in the 100, which was started back in April 2001. Right now, my journey is still in the service industry because, I mean, the 100 is all about serving and giving back and helping people. And that's the arena. I mean, now my focus now is all about helping people to um, lose weight and reverse diabetes. Really, it, I, I, my, my work now is about all around health and well-being, which is quite pertinent considering the time we're in, the coronavirus times and the kind of com comorbidities that make people more susceptible to the negative vagrancy of the COVID virus. So uh, in, in a sense, my total life has been dedicated to, to serving people and, and helping improve the people's lives in a certain way, but the 100 certainly um, was a pivotal moment in that journey, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later on. Thank you, Ken. Um, I I'll tell the story of how we met. And, you know, we're old enough that we don't have to blush about that story. Mm -hmm. and the venue, I can see Olu Olu laughing because he knows how you and I met. Olu, um, unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please. Uh, you see, you, you need to figure out how to unmute yourself a little bit quicker. Yeah, 
There you go. Yeah. Am I on now? Indeed you are. Hi, hello, good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, gentlemen. Nice to see you all again, Mr. President. <laughs> and Paul. <laughs> um, Oluwalake, yes, um, I um, am currently working for the London Marathon Charitable Trust and running my own um, cultural um, policy consultancy as well. And not too dissimilar to Ken, um, the focus of my current work is about is about health and wellness um, for the London Marathon Trust using the profits of the marathon to develop programs and projects to um, remove barriers to participation in physical activity, especially for underrepresented groups. And um, other than that, I work for various cultural, um, arts and cultural and heritage organizations, doing evaluations, reviewing their work, giving them ideas as to how they can do them better and so on. And I'm a father. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> so, can put that at the front, dude. <laughs> and husband, I'd better say that as well before I get myself into trouble. <laughs> yes, indeed, you best. Look, thank you, Olu, it's been a while. I remember back in the day, we used to exchange in message at two, three o'clock in the morning when we discovered that neither of us bother with this thing called sleep. It seemed to be an irrelevance at the time. Um, third, the third, our third president who's here today. We do have one missing, but you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. You can't get the full set. Um, Kola, you're a recent guest, so you know how this works. I, uh, I know how this works. Hey, everyone. Uh, I am Kola Relution IK. So yeah, I was the third president in line. So I kind of very much had that feeling of standing on the shoulders of giants with uh, Ken and Ulu. They really kind of set things up um, incredibly. Um, and really, in a way, my journey, I think, was how much I learned and how much I grew from the role of president. In truth, I, I don't think I said this at the time, but I'd never had a leadership position before. <laughs> so the 100 really is what um, gave me a lot of the kind of experience of leadership. In terms of now, I am a barrister. I'm also a communication skills coach. So I help people um, communicate effectively for better careers and business. Um, and I've remained obviously part of the 100 itself. I'm actually, I was elected to the board of the 100 Black Men of America. So I actually sit on the board of the 100 Black Men of America or 100 Black Men International as it is, as the international district rep. Uh, and I'm still working within the 100 under our current president, uh, Ola, who you'll hear from in a second. He dragged me out of retirement to do work on the um, business program that we've got. So yeah, 100 is a big part of my life. Uh, two kids and a wife uh, who um, know how much the 100 is. So the 100 is kind of like my third kid, I'd probably say. Uh, but yeah, that's me. Great to be here, man. Yeah, just like the mafia, you're not really allowed to leave. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <That's laughs> you're like not really allowed. They pull you back in. <laughs> yeah, you're not really allowed to leave. You can try. But uh, we'll find a way to pull you back in. And, and, and last, and certainly not least, our current current president, who needs to unmute himself, because he is still muted. Ola, please introduce yourself, sir. Uh, thank you, Paul. And uh, good to see you, Mr. President. Been a while. <laughs> um, thanks, Paul, for putting this together. Uh, always a great show. Um, always good to be uh, you know, one of your invitees. As the president of the current 100 Black Men of London, it's been interesting. And I'll use this opportunity to say to my fellow president, you didn't give me the whole picture. <laughs> uh, it, it's a big shoe to step into, and there's a lot that needs to be done. We've been running for 20 years. We've been doing the work consistently. And the evidence of what we do has been seen by people that step up to us and tell us what we've done in their lives. Individually, I'm a solution architect. I work within the IT and program management stream. Um, I've taken time out this year with coronavirus and all to help in revamping the 100. So I'm gonna go back to work sometime early next year. So I'm using this time to exploit the opportunity available to move the 100 into the space that we need to occupy. So solution, looking at problems, that's what I do. And I'm bringing those um, into the 100 to make it happen. 
Look, um, I, I can look into the Zoom feed and I can see so many names that I recognize. Um, and I suspect it's the same thing out there in Facebook land. So many people who have been with the 100 for a very long time. So many parents who have, you know, trusted us with their children. And I, and I don't use that word very, very lightly, you know. Um, again, and, you know, Ken will remember this. And certainly Olu, who were there very early days, you know, one of the first things that we, we had to contend with was just understanding the level of trust that was required for parents. Because we're going to talk about the programs we do, but our landmark program, which remains our landmark program to this day, was very, very much the very first program we kicked off. And that was our community mentoring program. And the community mentoring program has been our most consistent program. It's been running since, since day one. But I want to revisit with Ken, just about, for those who don't understand that you are not just the first president, but you were the founder of the London chapter. You wanna share with people how we came, how that came to be? Well, uh, well you know, it, it, it's, it's a, a pivotal, um, well, a pivotal moment in my life and something I'm always, I will always be proud of. Uh, uh, let me just say to, to Ola, we just mentioned that we didn't tell him everything. I, I would kind of recontextualize that statement and say, you could never appreciate any, everything until you step into the shoes. Um, it's always easy looking on the outside. And, but when you step into the shoes, only you really realize how big those shoes really are. So that's just rephrasing what you said. Uh, the 100 Black Men of London was really born out of passion. It was born out of a man who, who just looked at his children, two girls. And the, the pivotal moment was when I said, look, I want my two girls to grow up in an environment where they can feel safe and also to find a prospective suitor who has all the credentials that any father um, would want. And if I want that, then I feel I need to do more than just talk about it. I need to get in involved in the process of helping nurturing those young people. So that was the turning point, but I'm gonna go back very, very slightly to, to how the Birmingham chapter started and it was for, and it was for, uh, it was for Carl George and he had a call to say he's been introduced to this organization in America called 100 Black Men of America. They're having an event in New Orleans. He doesn't know anything about it. Should we travel over to um, New Orleans? And we did, and cut a long story short, we've been incredibly impressed. So we came back and we started that chapter in Birmingham and that chapter progressed. But obviously traveling from London to Birmingham um, was uh, quite a, a strain on me. And it just came to the point we decided, look, London is possibly the place to, to start um, the first chapter within London. And it, it was back in November, and I have to give credit here um, to my friend Lloyd Dixon. I have to really give credit to him because, you know, I sat down in my study with Lloyd and I said, Lloyd, look, there's this organization. I want to start here in London. This is what about, are you in? And he said, Ken, I'm in. And it, it, it was that it was that moment where I thought, okay, well, I have one person at least. It's just not me by myself. And I then proceeded to to go about the arduous task of recruiting men like yourself, Paul, men like Ola, Olu, to um, start this passionate journey. And you know, the the, the moment it really started was April two thousand, back in the restaurant on City Road. Um, and if you know that restaurant, we were there, not every month, not every other week, but every single Monday, we were there in the beginning. And, you know, it was so inspiring to be around a group of men who were not, who, who weren't being paid, but were passionate with a common goal, were willing to meet for one to two hours every Monday, and then invest their time every Saturday in our flagship mentoring program to me, I can be, and for me, it was incredibly inspiring. And, and, I, and I really want to pay testament to, to the legacy of the 100 because there are many organizations here that exist in London and throughout the UK who are only in existence because of the ripple effect that they've gained through the confidence of what the 100 has achieved. 
achieved. So every single member should be incredibly proud. And uh, and ho maybe your 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 hopefully your reference point of how we how you got into hundred is the same as mine. But I know from my recollection, correct me if I'm wrong, we went to the same gym together. Yeah. We, so for for those who are gonna be wondering, I used to go to the gym. <laughs> Yeah, and that's where Ken walked up to me in the gym. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. Your yeah. recollection is 100%, right. sir. That's right. And, and, and Paul, you, you, are, you, are the, you are the one and only person who I've ever headhunted. I saw you, I saw your energy, and I said, this man will make a great attribute. And you were the only person throughout the history who I ever purposely went after. So that's a testament to you, Paul. And and your contribution to 100 has been invaluable over the years. So this is how um, myself and Paul came. And, and I, I came up to Paul, I gave Paul the option, and he said, yeah, he, he was very amicable, but there was no resistance, and he's been that way ever since. So April 2001, we had our first meeting. We came together, really, we're just some passionate men. We wasn't really sure exactly how we'd make a difference. We just knew we wanted to make a difference. And 20... 21, 22 years on, look where we are and the amount of lives that the 100 has indirectly and directly impacted, I, I don't, cannot be counted. It can't be counted the amount of people whose lives that we're impacted. And as I said, for me, it's the, it's the proudest thing. Besides being a father, obviously, I'm incredibly proud of my two beautiful girls. But outside of that, as a person achieved as a man, the, the formation of the 100 Black Men, it has been um, my proudest achievement. And I've done some things in my life, but it, it's, a, it's a legacy which will live on far beyond my years. And, and you know what, Ken, you're absolutely right. As, as I come to Ol Olu, um, I just want to remind people that the, the 100 has been consistent. Yeah. So we've never failed to deliver our community mentoring program that program which was understood to be the best way and the most effective way that we as a group of volunteers, men and women, by the way, because we have women in the organization, we thought that the community mentoring program was by far the most effective way to reach out to our community. And, you know, for those of you who don't understand what, what that means, what it means is that three years ago, I was walking down the road in Bishopsgate and a big man, my height, walks up to me and says, you're Paul Lawrence from the 100. And I say, yeah. And he said, you guys saved my life. Those were his exact words. And people like Ken and Olu and Kola, you guys will remember this young man because at the time, him and his sister used to come to the 100 when we were by Philip Lane, Marcus Garvey Library. <clears throat> and the young man was bad to the bone. And I remember that we took a decision that every session he came to, two of us would sit, one to his left and one to his right. And that, that, that was the only way we could see him making it through the session. And that young man, Ola and Kola, you'll remember, he came back and offered us coding courses for the young people, yeah? And he took me through the college. His name is Peter, if I remember carefully. And he said to me, point blank, look, he was on a path. And he looks at the path of his other young people in his area. And he knew that it were it not for the 100. And so... Paul, I wonder if I could... Uh, could I add something to that? I think yeah, it's of course. Per pertinent because I think that in every journey, there's a pivotal moment. And in our journey in 100, there's been many, many pivotal moments. And I know Olu especially will, 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 will resonate with Olu and yourself. I think the most pivotal, one, the, the, the initial pivotal moment was when we first completed our first program and we was in the Tottenham Centre. Oh, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that to me. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I, I'm going to share this time. <laughs> and, and we had... We structured, we all structured the, 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 the day so the young people would speak and the parents would speak. And it was a young man. Uh, his name fails me. But I, I was, yeah, a very small guy. And I remember, I remember being the moderator. And I remember interviewing this guy. I was speaking to him and he began to speak. And I 
was just focused on him. And he began to speak about how he had been impacted by the 100. And I looked at him and we had the men lined up at the back. And I just looked at the back and I saw men, grown men with tears in their eyes. Weeping. And it, and it, was, it was such a, an impactful moment because I think, and I know Olu would testify to this. I think prior to that, we had not realized the impact that we were making because we were just doing it out of passion. But that pivotal moment <clears throat> was, I think, was a foundation in us realizing that collectively we really could make a difference. I uh, cannot I believe you remind me of that. <laughs> yes, sir. Without warning me first. It was it was a dreadful situation. Every big man a ball. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 great and absolutely wonderful. So I I know Ono would add on to that, but for me that was that was definitely one of the first pivotal moments where not only did I realise your organization was made could make a, a real difference, mm-hmm. but the sincerity, the depth and the integrity of the men that was in the organization. Olu, what brought you to the hundred and what's kept you here? Um I pre- um, can you hear me, Paul? Loudly. Okay, yeah. What brought me to the 100 <laughs> was actually you, Paul, <laughs> if you may remember. Um, so at the time, back in um, 2000, um, Paul and I, and quite a few people I'm sure who are listening as well, um, belonged to a social group, the Executive and Professionals Network. EPN, um, as it was at the time, and um, a group of us um, at EPN had, you know, we all had a fantastic time at EPN, um, you know, met some absolutely incredible people, had some fantastic parties, um, but there were a group of us who yearned to do a bit more and realized that EPN was doing its own thing, but that wasn't the vehicle for the kind of community level engagement that we wanted to to have. And um, I remember Paul coming up to me um, um, at one of the at one of the socials and um, saying, I met this guy the other day um, who has something interesting to say. It might be the kind of thing that we've been talking about. I said, okay, let's go along, meet this guy. So we went over to that restaurant on City Road, which I passed a few <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago um, and took a picture of it because I still remember those days very, very well. Met Ken, um, I think there were four of us at the meeting. Um, he talked about what the vision was, what the 100 has been doing in America, what he had been doing in Birmingham and what we could do in London. And from that moment, I was in. You know, um, like Ken says, um, I thought, you know, at the very, very least, we will do some good. Um, even if it's to one person, that would be worth it. We didn't really have a clue what we would be, how we would be going about it um, ourselves. We knew we'd mentor, we knew, we knew there was a need, and we knew we had passion, we knew we had a shared vision, and that was it really, that was all we needed. Um, the next challenge was, does anybody else see this? Does anybody else actually really need it? And do they need it enough to actually sign up, you know, to being a part of it, both in terms of being a mentor and in terms of parents and young people um, and other referrers who would want um, their children or their wards to come to us? It was like magic, you know, we were, it was like, it was like tapping into an oil well, you know, the gush was immediate um, and yeah, it's just gone and gone ever since. I, th- I think the important thing for people to understand is that, you know, it, it, it's about the right product at absolutely the right time. Yep. So when Ken stepped up to me, he invited me, he was having introduction sessions at Tower Hill Hotel. Um, and that's where he went through his 46 slideshow, 46 page slideshow. But I didn't realize it was that many, Paul. <laughs> yeah, tr- trust me, <laughs> it, 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 it was. <laughs> it it was just 25. The, the, the key, the key yeah. thing, the key thing is that he got me long before he got to slide 30. You know, 
So I think if memory serves me, your last slide said something, your last two slides said something like, do you care? And then the next slide said enough. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 mem if memory serves me well. And you had me hooked long before that. And I'll, I'll make my confession, which I, I know I've shared with you guys before. You know, my reason for joining the 100 were entirely selfish. Yeah. If you guys remember, at that time, my son was under 10 years old. Yeah. I had no point of reference as to how to really grow this young black man up in the UK. And here were a group of black guys saying they want to work with young people. I thought, well, it's got to be as good a place as any. And that's one of the, my great motivating reasons for, for joining the 100. And, you know, when Ken said, look, he's trying to develop young people that were worthy of his daughters. I thought that's a noble enough reason for me. Yeah, absolutely noble enough. And so when we think about the four tenets of the 100, which are economic development, health and well-being, mentoring and education, it just seemed like a great place to be. So, Collar, Mr. President. Yeah, we do it like the US. Once a president, forever a president. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Collar, what brought you to the 100 and what's, what's kept you there, aside from us dragging you out of retirement mm -hmm. every chance we get? Yeah, my, so my path was a relatively straightforward one in that I kind of got to that stage. And this is one that I think a lot of members come and come in with. I kind of got to that stage where I knew I was fine personally in my life, you know, as a lawyer and stuff like that. But I, I knew that I needed to do more. I've, you know, it's that kind of I want to give back. So I came along to a meeting. can't remember where it was. And yeah, a bit like, a bit like pretty much everyone, but certainly you, Paul, was saying, is they had me at hello. It was kind of like, okay, yeah, be done with the slides and all the chat, and where can I sign up? Um, but that was the early days in a sense. I mean, you say early days, that was like 2004. And I remember I had to fight to get in, right? So the processes weren't like as slick as Ola has got them working now, right? So I remember having to call a few times to kind of say, hey, guys, I want to join. What's going on? What do I do next? And really had to kind of push for it. Um, but what you kind of saw right from the start is the passion. There's, there's something about a group of people who are doing it just out of love, right? Because no one's getting paid. In fact, not, not even you, you're not getting paid. You are paying for the privilege of giving more of your time. And there's, there's something about sitting in a room with people just trying to figure things out and do things just out of the passion of, it's got to be done. It needs to be done. And we want to do it. Um, and, you know, you'd all, you know, I, I remember it probably was Ken. I can't remember. But it was one of the speeches that, you know, somebody just got up and said, you know, the, look, if not now, when, if not us, who? And that always stuck with me. It's like, yeah, we can't pass this on to anyone else. And we can't wait to do the stuff that needs to be done. In terms of what kind of hooked me, I, I still remember... Um, on the mentoring program, you get allocated, um, although it's group mentoring, right? You get allocated an individual um, mentee. I remember being allocated one brother and you know, it was one of those, right? So you call in between the group sessions. So when you're with someone, you can see them physically, you can kind of play off body language and everything. But on the phone, unless you're talking, there's nothing, right? <laughs> so, you know, I'd call and say, hey, you know, hey, how you doing? Where are you? It's Collar. Yeah, how have your week been? All right. And I, oh boy, man. And the whole conversation would just be monosyllabic. And this went on for months. And I'm thinking, what's, you know, what am I doing here? But I remember listening to people like Ulu and all that saying, yeah, mentoring very much is a journey. It's a process. And just showing up is as much a part of it as anything you do. So I'd still be making that call, making that call. And I remember it's about maybe six months of doing this, like every week, every other week. And then one time I picked up the call, the phone and called him and was like, okay, yeah, how, how are you doing? And just, oh yeah, yeah, today was really good because I did it and just yapped and blabbed and yapped, just totally opened up. And from that moment, it just changed. He was just a totally different guy. And it was, I remember listening on the phone, like, have I got the wrong, <laughs> the wrong kid or something? But it was just, it was a testament to 
the mentoring and the way the 100 does it and the importance of black men being involved and staying the course because what was clear and I'd heard it on the training but I hadn't really appreciated it until then was that the biggest element of the reason that we are successful is the consistency it is being there week in week out whether people show up or not whether people are interested or not just continually doing it same message we believe in you we trust you we love you we support you we cherish you all of those things that just opened this particular kid up and actually opened up a lot of the mentees and once you kind of get that experience of mentoring you're hooked for life right it's like there's there's, there's nothing you're ever going to leave because of that so that was a real kind of personal hook for me as much as I knew the work we were doing was important that was one of the moments that just everything clicked in for me and since then, you know, just been being doing it, a, a kind of a, a separate highlight of it is always every year we, except for this year because of coronavirus, we take some of the mentees to the conference in the US with all the chapters, uh, you know, 100 chapters or so across the, the, the 100 Black Men movement. And we always make our mentees give a speech um, at kind of one of the, the gala events. And, you know, you watch them going in and they're always nervous, you know, some more confident than others, some can't believe they're going to do it, some nervous, but then they do it and they nail it all the time. And especially that British accent always gets the Americans as well. So <laughs> they have that added advantage. But then you see them when they come out after the speech or when they come off stage, they're literally just a couple of inches taller. You can see it. It's a moment. It's like, wow, I just addressed a thousand people. I did that. And we record it. And you can see they've grown. That's another moment that for me always does it every year. And every year I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not crying. I just got something in my eye, you know? <laughs> uh, so, you know, just moments like that make it worthwhile. And then, you know, the personal growth you get. So the hundred is something special. It's, it's a group of brothers and sisters that are doing the work. You know, everyone else is talking fine, but we are actually doing the work. And there's, there's something special about that. I think while I'm with you, let me just ask you a quick question, which has come up in the chat. And it's just a quick question. What would you say, briefly, the, the biggest thing you've learned along the way, Collar? Oh, wow. Biggest thing I've learned. Uh, so in terms of me personally, I would just say, I would, I would encapsulate it as leadership. I, I, it's difficult to kind of nail it as just one small thing. I'd never had any experience of leadership before. It was an incredible learning ground, both from seeing what had gone before me, making a whole load of mistakes that it was a safe space to learn from. And then really, I think, developing certainly my own approach and model of leadership of the ability to engage with people, move them towards a common vision uh, in a way that everyone feels invested in. That is a life skill that I have benefited from hugely in my life that I am passing on to my children uh, and basically anyone that will listen. So I would say that's the one big thing um, that I'd learned. And in terms of community, it's really about showing up. There's there, you can make a lot of mistakes um, in what you do, but showing up and doing it is 100% better than talking about it, but actually not showing up to do anything. Okay, all right, look, first of all, um, thanks so much. Just a quick update for people. Our new website, the 100's new website, uh, has been launched in the next few days, and that will be 100bmol.org.uk. It's a new website. That's going to be a thanks, Brian and Ola, for posting that. See, Ola, Ola is showing not just leadership, but multitasking ship. So he's, he's also about to speak to him. Ola, tell me, what brought you to the 100? You, you, you're, you're our recent president. So I know, I know your, your reason for wanting to be president. You know, I get that. But I want to ask the same question I asked you and I'll ask the other, the other former presidents as well. What's the biggest lesson you've learned being in the 100? Uh, leadership. Uh, how did I get to 100? I think I'm lucky and like the fellow president mentioned, I came to one of the uh, open day events and I was captured from the hello. I've been mentoring people before the 100, but I've been doing that on my own. And the 100 kind of give you that platform, that structure to be able to reach more. Now for people that have been blessed and things have been working for you, even though you don't have a mentor, 
but you are the forerunner in your community for most things you do. And you want to educate others along that line. And the 100 give me the opportunity to let others see what they could do. Like we say in the 100, we want to build the community. We want to make our young people the best version of themselves. So men and women that come together, it gives us that platform to be able to educate and mentor and coach the next generation to bring them in. What have I learned uh, in this role? Like Ken mentioned, it's an ever-growing role and in demand more from you. You are growing with the role. Many things is happening. As you are looking, um, there's changes in the community and you need to try to anticipate that. Try to build a team. And the best way is to when you meet people that want to do this. And when you come together, you know, that synergy in the team that you're all working for the same thing is beautiful. And that, that hits me right here. Not just the results that we get from young people. When you see people that want to work for the community and the, the heart is there and they're working together. Sometimes just before COVID hits, sometimes I'm in a meeting and I step back and I just look at everybody, look at their passion and that, that drives me. I, I enjoy that and I talk. We could, we could do whatever we put our hands to and that's what the 100 in, in short. I think you know what very very much that those those are the things that have kept kept me around uh, uh, for such a long time, and and for those people who are new and don't know, I'm going to repeat again: the 100 is not just a mentoring organization. You know, when when Ken and and friends decided to to kick this off, it wasn't just to mentor a couple of kids. Let, let's be crystal clear, and we've done a whole lot more than that. The 100 at its heart, its ethos is about community change. And yes, unashamedly, we understand that if you're gonna to try to change your community, you have to start perhaps with the most valuable resource, which are the young people. But that's not where it ended, is it, Ken? You know, we started with that, but we've moved on to, we, we, we've included programs now that talk about mentoring, absolutely. We've had educational programs. We have health and well-being. We have uh, economic development. And I know that in the early days, our focus was the mentoring because let's just be straight. We had capacity issues, you know? It was difficult to, to, to widen our way out to all of that. But if I remember carefully, for example, we quickly realized that just mentoring the young people and their parents just going home or sitting out in the car park, because by this time we had the sessions down in Elephant and Castle, yeah, at um, South Bank University, we used to have a room there and the parents would typically wait outside. And one of the parents, Jennifer Lewis, made a decision that that wasn't good enough. And out of that was born our parenting program where we, 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 we started to work with parents as well because we always considered, and you know, if I remember those days, Ken, we actually went into a school down in Lee. I don't know if you remember the name of that school, because I don't. Yeah, it was um, Northbrook School. Northbrook School, right, right Northbrook beside School. the Sainsbury's. So yeah, we were exactly. we were not only going into, on Saturdays, we were also going into schools and working with the young people. So I, I really want people to grasp what it is this group of people, men and women, have done. You know, it's a lot more than just mentoring a couple of kids. Ken, we now have um, business programs. Yeah, um, led by people like Collar, we have business programs. We have a very robust health and well-being section. Um, yesterday, I, I believe we went on a Black History Walk. Was that the vision you had that we would expand out into all of the four for the future? I'm certainly for uh, Can I just possibly answer the question you asked, um, Collar, and all about what um, I personally learned? I mean, I could sum it up into two brief sentences, and the first one is I truly learned that no one can sincerely help someone else without receiving some, a greater gift back in return. And, and I know that sounds idealistic, but truly I, believe, I really learned the power of giving, but how you can receive by giving. And then I also learned how a, a small group of committed men can come together with a common vision and collectively they can truly make a difference. Let no one doubt that. Let no one doubt if that a few people come together with a common vision consistently and persistently, they can 
make a difference. And, you know, it, it's given me confidence to be able to do, you know, anything is possible when people come together. So the, the vision for the 100 was, I'll, I'll be absolutely right, it, it wasn't just a mentoring organization uh, because it, it was aimed at being a bastion. I mean, black men in general still get lambasted in so many ways for their uh, quote unquote um, negative and irresponsible ways. And the, the 100 black men was meant to stand as, as a bastion of men who were prepared to counter that narrative. Uh, men who were prepared to stand up and be counted. Men who were prepared to invest not just their time, but their money. Men that were prepared to do more than talk over the dinner table with the rice and peas about how society was. But men were prepared to turn their talk into action. And it had to extend um, past mentoring in, in my um, world, and which is why the holistic side of the 100 Black Men was really, really um great to me. The mentoring is where we started and we quickly moved on to something called Education Through Film. And the Education Through Film program was wonderful. We impacted so many people um, through that program and it was a way to be able to educate people about different aspects of their lives. But the sheer growth of the 100 and the momentum it took really propelled the organization into a strategy. Just to give an example, when the organization first started, there were people who said, look, don't call me at work or don't send me an email at work because it had the words 100 black men on it. There were organ there were people who I called and they said, where are you from? And I said, 100 black men. And they would say, hold on a minute. And they didn't come back. So I then abbreviated to 100 BMOL. So we was at that point where it, there was the stigma associated because, you know, they used to say where two or three black men are gathered, then there's going to be a riot. Um, but, you know, collectively, the, 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 the members collectively moved that from an organization, the name that people were scared of, to an organization where we went to Park Lane and we went to the Hilton Hotel and we had a gala. This was a voluntary organization with not one single paid member. And we had Lennox Lewis, Tier Henry, Michael Watson, 750 people guests there being live over the world and our, and our program brochure had words from the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister in it. That's where a few guys who were committed moved the 100. And that's what it was about because at that moment, you know, there was an organization called Accenture who had never ever sponsored a black organization before, but they were invited and they were so impressed by what we were doing we became the first organization for them to invest in. So for me, the 100 Blackman was a, a bigger organization than for mentoring. It was about men standing up and being counted. And that stood up is when we did our first program in, in, in Northbrook. And when these boys saw us, you saw them sit up because they saw black men that were coming in to be able to empower them. So my vision for the 100 was always great and just um, mentoring, it was always some of the things it's done to create a ripple effect to give people the confidence to be able to do what they do, but also to stand as, as a bastion of what black men can do when they collectively come together. Look, um, lovely having this conversation. There are lots of questions in the team which I'll, I'll try to go through um, a little bit later on. Um, Ola, you've disappeared from my main screen, but I, Olu rather, but I know you're, you're, you're still there. In, in your time as president, what, what would you say was the, the, the big thing that you learned? And what, what about the 100 are you, are you most proud of? Because this is unashamedly a celebration program about the 100. Yeah, it is unashamedly about us celebrating the 100. And, 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 I, and I'll, be, I'll be frank, the 100, as someone said earlier, has given birth to a lot of other organizations. I have been told directly by people who now run organizations of their own that they see the 100 as the big brother. I think the idea of men standing up and just doing it and say, look, we're black men, we're gonna do this. We, we, we don't really care what you wanna say. We don't want your money. We're gonna fund it ourselves. We're gonna put our hands into our pocket and get this done. It created a sea change in how black men, first of all, saw themselves and saw themselves capable of doing it. I get it that maybe the 100 is not the same flavor for everybody, but what I have seen is a number of black male organizations who 
who are unashamed about black manhood, yeah, and are willing to stand up and do their own thing. So, Olu, what, what what's the big thing for you? What's the great achievement? What's the great learning that you've had? You need to unmute again, by the way. You take your time, yeah? You, you just take your time. Smooth. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you muted me, Paul, and you've always been doing that. Um, <laughs> the, okay, I'll start with answering the question that you asked the others as well, and what I've learned, um, and it's not too dissimilar to what Ken said. It's about the power of us. You know, that's what I've learned more than anything else. The power of us as an organization, the power of us as a community, the power of us as black men, and the power of us as individual men, you know, um, are all the things that I've learned um, in, in my time in the 100. Um, more so um, when I became um, president of the organization as well. Although, um, you know, you don't learn that when you become president, you learn that, <laughs> you know, um, in your journey, um, to becoming president, otherwise you'd never get to a point where you become president um, um, at all. And what you also understand is that you, you I mean, as Ken said, um, you know, a small group of men who have got the right ingredients of passion, vision, competence, you know, can move mountains. And it's really, really important, you know, in lessons of leadership to understand the importance of having the right team around you. You know, you can have the best vision in the world, but you can't move by yourself and you need that team around you, you know, to help you do the heavy lifting so that you can do the visioning. You know, um, there's a big difference between being a leader and being a manager. One of the um, great conversations, one of the many great conversations that I had with Ken was actually about, about that, you know, about how um, you, when you birth an organization, you know, it's a bit like being, it's a bit like a child and, you know, you need a, a particular skill set to conceive and deliver the child. You need another set of skills to raise the child and you need another set of skills, you know, to nourish the child at different ages and so on. And that's how it is in the hundreds. Well, one person cannot embody all those skills. You know, and the work of the leaders to identify where the organization is at at that point in time and to make sure that they are surrounded with the right kind of skills and the right kind of mindsets to ensure that, you know, where the organization is at at that point in time is, you know, the right place it needs to be. Keeping one eye on the back, um, uh, on the past and another very, very firmly on the future. And that future is encapsulated within the vision of the organization. And my proudest moment um, as, as a member of the, of the 100 actually came at a schools program. Um, and it wasn't Northbrook, it was actually Alexandra Park um, in, in North London. As Ken said, we used to have not just the mentoring programs, um, the community mentoring programs, but also the school's mentoring program as well, which was very, very interesting. I actually learned so much more, I think, from those schools programs than I learned from anything else um, um, in my work in the 100, because you actually then realized very, very quickly how the limitations of the education system in this country and how it particularly impacts on black, black children, especially black boys. And schools were using the 100 for, um, for different reasons. You know, a school like Northbrook was using um, the 100's mentoring program as a developmental program for um, all the children that they, um, you know, saw had potential more or less, you know, so they identified children um, who, you know, had a lot, who had demonstrated something but needed something more which the school couldn't give and we were able to provide that. Other schools saw us as the last resort for, you know, before they kick out the bad boys, you know, so that they could tick that box and say, we did everything we could, we even brought in a group of their own to talk to them and it didn't work. You know, to be perfectly honest, that was how some saw us. And I will never forget um, 
after a six week program at that school, the head coming to us, I think it was me, Ken and David Okoro, who, who were there on the day and said, I don't know what you did, but they're different. What did you do? And we said we talked to them. <laughs> you know, we had we had we didn't have any baggage. We didn't have any um, you know hangups. We believed in them, and we talked to them. You know, and they believed in us. And one of the the first time we went in, I actually remember one of the boys looking at us and saying, "Well, look at this black men in suits," and the other one saying, "And they're not even going to court." You know, and when you talk about, you know, changing perceptions and changing, you know, the image of black manhood, it's small things like that, you know, that have been so powerful in the development and growth um, of the hundred. And then move on to, you know, the bigger vision things, the Black History Challenge, you know, which was, you know, probably still the largest inter-school Black History competition that we have seen in London. I forgot about that. I forgot. Oh about yeah, that. Donna will kill you if you Donna. I think she's on the call. <laughs> She'll kill you if you forget that one. We had what about forty schools participating, and, yeah, and a certain a certain mayor tried to copy it as well. A certain mayor tried to copy it. Well, I'm glad if you tried to copy it for the nation now, um, but uh, without stealing it um, incompetently. Um, you know, um, yeah, so we had that. We had, um, as Ken mentioned, you know, Education Through Film, which was our largest actual um, community outreach program. We reached so many more people and, you know, props to Tony Warner, you know, for developing that program um, for us. Um, we had the um, health programs and so on. So yes, yeah, about a big vision. You know, the four for the future is about not just like mentoring, but also education, health and wellness. Um, economic development and leadership development as well. So it's four plus one um, now that we focus on. And we had programs around all these and it gained such traction when we talk about, you know, evolution of the organization. Ken started with a passion, with a belief, with a big vision of what this organization could be. You know, when I took over, it was my job, you know, not just to keep that foundation solid, but also to build on that. And I could do that because I had people like Collar, like Paul and everything around me as well, who could take care of you know, the internal stuff while I could do more of the external focused stuff. So we had tables around, not just mayors, um, the mayor's table, um, but also you know, at ministerial level, the 100 would be called on to give their opinion and so on. And that's what the 100 was. That was what that small vision around a table in a restaurant in City Road became within two years. Look, guys, it's, um, it's a hell of a trip down memory lane. Um, I, I'm going to hold my hand up. And I've forgotten about the Black History Quiz, which was an incredible thing when you considered it was all organized by a, by a, a group of volunteers and I think at this point because I, I I value my life it is important that I raise a special word to the ladies who volunteer with the 100. Let us be crystal clear and this is my opinion anybody's free to disagree with what I'm about to say. It takes a very special type of woman to step up to an organization entitled the 100 Black Men and not just contribute, because if I say they contribute, that would be kind of a fudge as to the role the women have played. Yeah, we're talking about lead in many cases. Yeah, I, I, I don't care who, who agrees or disagrees with what I'm saying. I have seen it. Um, Zeno, has contacted me on Facebook and Zeno is one of our original ladies, people like Donna Spencer, Rosemary, if you remember Rosemary, yeah. Um, we're talking about women, uh, Jennifer Lewis, who I mentioned before, Leo, who's on the call now, the newer crop of ladies who I'm not that familiar because I don't, I don't get back into that level of business anymore, but they have been the backbone of our organization, yeah. Let's be clear, and this is no secret. We've never had a hundred men. <laughs> I, I, I think you. I think I think you're absolutely right there, Paul. I mean, I think the 
the New Stars program, which we implemented, um, gave the 100 a, a different perspective. It wasn't just female energy, and they weren't just making up the numbers. Um, I have to pay credit to Donna Spencer. She is a powerhouse and a, a credit to the 100. Um, nice lady. She's been, <laughs> she's been in, integral in, in many of the programs that we've done, and the, and the women have been. So, you know, as we sit here as men, um, we cannot sit here without paying due respect to the, 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 the women that have been pivotal in getting a number of our programs off the ground. But there was one program that, um, that as Ollie was mentioned, I wanted to mention, which was absolutely astounding. And that was our quality time program. And that was our Father's Day program. We held- You know what, Ken? This is the problem with doing so much. <laughs> yeah. You don't even remember some yeah. of the stuff we've done. Do you, do you, I don't know if you remember, we had the first quality time. I think it was about three coaches. And there were three coaches. We went, I think it was Chesterton we went to. No, no, no. And you're wrong, sir. What, 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 you're what, 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 you're wrong. wrong. You're wrong. It was Chesterton, Chesterton, but it wasn't three coaches. Was it four? Because the guys from Birmingham came down as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But it was wonderful. And, you know, the vision was we had men pushing prams. And, and people seemed perplexed to see all these men walking through. That was such a powerful. So just to add to the list Ola was making there, our quality time program were, uh, was for, for fathers was an incredibly powerful and uplifting um, program as well. Well, if we're, if, we're gonna... doing, if we're doing remembering other programs, one of my favorite was the book club. So I remember we had a book club event where this is in the days before Kindles, right? So we got a, a book company to donate, I think, 200 copies of Devil in the Blue Dress by Walter Mosley. And we physically posted those books out to people who registered for the event. We had Tommy Smith, Dr. Tommy Smith come, you know, the athlete, um, come down and he gave a speech. We had Alex Wheatle, the author, came down and gave a speech. And we literally got about 150 people together to an event to discuss a book that everybody had read. And we just talked about it and discussed and debated the ideas, had a speech from Tommy, stalls, stands, people discussing. It's just what just like magical. So there are there's loads of things that we that we have done that, you know, really is a testament, as I think everyone's been saying, to what can be done and achieved when people just sit down together and say, let's go. Ola, you were about to say something. Just one like... quick other program, Ola. There was the hundred day as well. I know we get it was a hundred day where we collectively volunteered to support other organisations. Do you remember that, that that as well? Those that, those were fantastic um, programs as well. Sorry, Ola, Ola, I'm just Mr. Current President, sir. Yeah. No, um, like you said, when we do so much, uh, sometimes uh, we need to remember <laughs> the book club. That was what um, John started my daughter's reading frenzy. She never stopped reading after that. In fact, it was her picture that was yes. used. As, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> and she voraciously go through books. You know, she's not doing her A-levels now. And she scaled through with all A's and that. Well, that's good. We got so many things coming out of it. What I want to mention is um, the vision of the 100 as it is now. Our vision is to be the leading youth and community development organization that uplift our community and empower our young people to be the best version of themselves. Now, for them to do that, like Paul mentioned earlier, we need both men and women to work together. The members are volunteer are the lifeblood of the 100. And the men are not doing that by themselves. The women are an integral part of that. And some of the women are working as hard, if not harder than some of the men. Donna Spencer, I mentioned your name as an example. You know, she's like a, like a mentor to me. Whenever, you know, I'm not doing what I need to do at the right time, you know, she's always there. And that is something that's always helpful. So men and women come together as a package. So whatever we do, with the name 100 Black Men of London, a lot of women see that and they say, they think there's no room for women. I want to use this opportunity to say, we need you women as well as the men. Together we can, we say within the hundred. So together, we're stronger. Uh, Paul, I know, I know I'm jumping in, but I'm sure each of us remembers, and I know we're, we're bigging up Donna here, but I'm gonna keep going. I'm sure each of us remembers the year when we had a gala event at the Institute of Directors. Donna had been uh, chosen as the volunteer of the year. And so she came up to stage to collect her award 
and you know the typical thing normally if you collect an award is to say thank you i thank everybody i thank whatever and donna proceeded to stand up and just blast us men <laughs> saying you're not doing a good enough job and red and it was one of those and the thing about that what i loved about that is two things one is the honesty of you know a volunteer and that's what i mean about you can't do that if you don't actually feel that you're working in a safe space right so the honesty the authenticity uh, of it but then also the fact that it made us better right it made us better and that's one of the things about men and women working together is that ability to work together collaborate and be better because we're all just trying to serve so i still i still remember I, that I, I just i just have you know that donna is scolding you in the chat for, 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 for telling, for to telling that you. story and personally i don't want to be in your shoes um you know normally she just calls me and puts me in my place <laughs> Yeah, she uh, that was that, and and she was right, right? We were we were kind of messing up in certain things, so she called us out on it. Look, ladies and gentlemen, look, it's 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 past the hour of three, which is normally the point at which I disconnect the the feed from Facebook, and anybody who's in the Zoom is happy to stay. Um, you know, my guests have given up an hour of their time. I can't ask them for a lot more. If they're able to stay after this, they're fine. If you're in on Facebook and you'd like to join us in the Zoom for whatever discussion continues after, you're welcome to do so. Look, from, from my standpoint, the, 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 the biggest thing about the 100 is that we set out with a vision, we set out to do something, and it's not always been easy, it's not always been perfect, but we have done it. Yeah, and, and that for me is the most important thing. Um, you know, there are questions which I'm asked consistently about young people. Is it just for boys? No, it's for boys and girls. Yeah, it's for boys and girls to come and see what, what better looks like. And, I, you know, I, I remember saying to somebody once that the 100 no longer has to prove to anybody that we're a great organization. Yeah, the proof is walking all around us. Yeah. In social media land, Every now and then you see a young person who will declare straight, I'm successful because I did this. I'm successful. Because, you know, we, we've got people who've gone off to Oxford and her dad, a great member and president of the 100 as well. And he said, or was it Cambridge? Cambridge rather. And, he, and she has said, she sent her thanks to the 100 as well for contributing. My son had to sit through the 100 programs about four times because I had him from, he was that age. And when we started, there was no other place for him to go on a Saturday. So he came with me to the 100 programs and I saw people being tolerant of his youth. He was young, he was like seven. He didn't know what he was talking about. People allowed him to answer, allowed him to take part in the programs. And that's the difference we've made. And I've always said to people, I would never encourage somebody to be a part of a program that I didn't want my son to be a part of. And that for me was a, was, a, was a major, major part about it. Um, I'm going to disconnect the feed out to Facebook. Before you land. do, before okay. you do go on, Mr. A President. Few, a few um, call to action. There's a few activities that are going on with the 100. Our community mentoring program uh, is currently taking registration. So I'm going to say the registration link for that is bid.ly forward slash 100 CMP20. I have a better idea. Send it to me on WhatsApp and I'll put it um, um, on my page in Facebook land so okay, that everybody good. will get that. I'll just talk about it and then you can do that later. We also have every last Thursday of the month, uh, we have a mental health session. Uh, currently we're doing uh, one month for the men, the other month for the women. So the registration for that I'll send out to you as well. Uh, last Thursday, um, we talked about prostate cancer. Uh, we had over 10 um, specialists advising us on, you know, what to do, what to look out for. We had a few people that have gone through this and remission. So those are things we speak about. Uh, we talked about in the past about the COVID scenario, things that are affecting us mentally, a place for men and women to come and talk freely and talk safely within a safe environment. So we're not keeping things in. On the second Wednesday of every month as well, at 6.30 p.m. We also do what we call action learning set. This is basically bringing a problem 
to a team and a team together with work to resolve that issue for you. And quite a few people are coming through now. It's using the power of the community or the power of a group in resolving the issues that might be, you know, uh, big to yourself. As I say, uh, two minds is better than one. When you have four minds working on the problem you've been looking at, they come from different angles and they share different lives on that. Currently, we also fundraising. The intention is for us to buy our own building. Um, we're trying to raise 200,000. We're kicking that off shortly. We've kicked that off already, but we're going to kick that officially soon. The intention is for everybody to support what we do. So we have our own building where we could mentor from, our own building where our young mentees that we call diamonds could come in and basically run the day as it is. Um, some of the ideas that have come through that they want to have a studio in there, they want to have a radio station in the future. All these are what we're doing. So we want the community to come together to support what we do. Now there's three things we normally ask everybody. The first one we say, join us. Because together we could do what we need to do, we can't do that ourselves. Then we say, if you cannot join us, then share our information. Connect to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Okay, we're all on those platforms. Share what we share. Let more people take advantage of the benefit of what we're putting out there. And if you can as well, everything we do costs money. You know, donate to our cause. Support what we do that way. Okay, we cannot do this ourselves. We are putting time in. We are putting our money where our mouth is. But we want you as well to do that for us. Because we're saying the 100, together we can. Thanks, Paul. Look, you know what, as I said um, when we started this, one of the great things about joining the 100 when I did is that it gave me a social circle. It gave me people who I've connected with. And even though Ken has not been in the organization for a while, he and I still do bits and pieces. And I know you're having something on Monday, Ken, that, that you want to mention, which we're doing together. Go for it. Yeah, um, absolutely, Paul. And this is a paid advert, by the way. He's paying me yeah, for this advert. Yeah, let me just say, uh, uh, and with all sincerity, you know, I um, want to commend you guys for being far more con than concerned. You guys showed you were concerned enough and, you know, and it's commendable to all of you guys, um, irrespective because 100 wouldn't, couldn't be 100 without with one man. And uh, I really appreciate you guys, you know, investing in, in, in the vision that was started back in 2001 and Ola now carrying it on. Uh, but as men, we have our own issues and, and we spend a lot of time looking after other people. But unless we look after ourselves, our inability to look after other people will be impacted. And, and myself and Paul will be having a, a conversation tomorrow in, in a, a weekly podcast I actually have. So Paul will be in the hot seat tomorrow um, with myself, uh, along with um, Rudy Liquid and, and, and Mr. P. Where we'll be discussing men's health issues. And, and, and in essence, we'll be discussing why is it that men are not focusing in on their health in the way they should do. It will be a very, very frank discussion. It's happening at 7 o'clock. It will be broadcast live on Facebook, on YouTube. And I'm sure Mr. Lawrence, as he always has, will be pivotal in that conversation. Um, I'm sure there will be a link on my page, but there will be a link on Mr. Lawrence's page where you could click on at, at seven o'clock tomorrow and watch it live on YouTube. So it's Make Health Your Habit special live and it's called The Men's Room because we're focusing specifically on issues facing men and I look forward to that with you tomorrow. So I, I know I'll be seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Oh, no, absolutely, Ken. You know what? Thanks for inviting me. Um, before we wrap up this section, Ola, sorry, not Ola, Olu. See, the, all these Nigerian guys, it's just so confusing for me. Well, we were too, we're too, we're too, two Jamaican guys can, can handle, you know? Yeah, I think we're kind of outnumbered still. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. it needs well, to be addressed. Yeah, well, yeah. look, as I said last week, 83%. Yeah. That's what they tell me. 83%. That's, that's good enough. Olu, what, what's, what's your, your parting words for our Facebook um, guests uh, before we, we cut? What, what's your parting words for them? in terms of the 100 and what they can do for us? Yeah, so um, I think there's one thing that um, I've mentioned in the chat, which I think is very important for everyone to, to, to notice. And in many ways, the successes of the 100 um, can kind of obscure the 
reality of the practicalities that we've actually been, been, been working with. So if the organization that within a year of his existence was packing out, you know, Park Lane and everything, um, gave the impression of an organization that was, you know, far larger than it actually was. And our impact ever since has actually um, continued to obscure some of those practicalities. The 100 Black Men of London has never had 100 Black men as members. When you consider the number of Black men in London, you know, that says a lot, you know, um, as well. Yet in all that time, in 20 odd years, 100 has not missed one year of running its programs, you know, um, and we have done all that without having received one penny in public funds. People should let that sink in. Organizations have risen and have fallen on the back of having received hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of pounds of- 1.3 million to be exact. A billion even, as we've recently found out, and not delivered a thing, you know, for anybody. We have not received a penny in public funds. We have survived and we have thrived from the generosity of the members and of the supporters of the organization and the ingenuity, frankly, of our own fundraising efforts and you know, the supports that we have garnered. So um, if there's one message I can leave everyone listening or watching with today, it is this. The men, if you're a man or if there are men in your life, either your husband, your partner, your fathers, your you know, sons, you know, that you know you know, would like to be or could be a part of the solution to the issues that we have in London, that our young people face, that our communities face, then you can direct them in the way of the hundred to be a member, to be a donor, to be a supporter in any way that they can. You know, it only takes giving up a few hours of your time a month to make the difference in the life of a child. And there is nothing else that you can do that would be more valuable than that. So I'd really, really enjoy everyone to you know, get that message out to, um, to people and um, you know, where they can. If any of this touches you in a particular way, get in touch with Ola and the crew and they'll hook you up. Okay. Um, Tola, any, any parting word before we disconnect that feed? Yeah, um, I actually wanted to add what Tuolu said about not missing a year of the program, including, and this is really a testament to Ola and the team he's built around him, including during the COVID, they immediately transitioned to delivering mentoring online. I can see a number of the team. I was incredibly impressed with that because I wasn't involved in doing that, any of that part of it. I wondered how it would be done and they seamlessly moved along and had a graduation virtually that was still impactful as well. And I still saw some tears even online. So um, that's a testament. And in fact, what I would say is my parting words in a way would be one of the lessons I think the hundred can be as an example to the many other organizations that have grown, um, maybe inspired by the hundred, maybe um, directly influenced by the hundred. One of the things that I've always loved about, about the hundred, which has helped me personally, is our commitment to standards is our belief that you have to do the right way because if things aren't done the right way now it has a ripple effect going in future right so do things the right way at the time you're doing them plan right structure right get the finances right engage with individuals right because if you don't do those things that seem yeah it's easy you know you can you can easily be casual about it it has a massive impact as you go forward. And then the holes and the gaps and the flaws in how you, how you kind of arrange things and structure things are revealed. And it's one of the things I'd have always loved about the 100. When I was working in whatever we're working, we really start from first principles. Why are we doing this? How should we do this? How can we make this event fantastic? What are all the little logistics, right? That nobody will ever see but us, but we know that if we don't do it properly, it will have a negative impact. So I think that's one of the great lessons and why I think actually we have endured for so long. You know, classic examples are our elections. Every, every time we have elections, we, we are 
very strict about it and we do it properly and we commission an elections team to look at it and arrange it properly nobody else ever sees it but we know that by doing things the right way it helps us to be sustainable and it helps us to be well structured and that then means we can do the great work that we do so that i think is a lesson that i would encourage other organizations members within the hundred right now other people in lives is commit to high standards because it has a massive impact on the outcome um, and achievement of your goals look um guys it's it's always great i remember the last time so many presidents were in a room it was a it was a um, graduation over at ucl um and i can see tony harrison i don't know if tony's still on this but he was he was there that day. I still have the photos and, and so on. And it's always been great. You know, we've not always agreed. We've, we've you know, as in everything, if you have two big ships in a harbour, they, they're going to bump, they're going to bump bits and pieces, but we never let that destroy what was the ultimate objective of the organisation. And I, for one, am tremendously proud to, 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 to wear my pin when I'm forced to wear a jacket. You all know I hate jackets. I hate ties and that sort of stuff, but it's always great to, 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 to step out in a 100 pin. It is something that has tremendous, tremendous importance in, in, in the stuff that I've done. Um, for those who don't know, it was the 100 that gave me my first opportunity to speak in front of a massive crowd publicly um, at one of our galas. I think we had that year, we had something like 1200 people in the place and you know it was just a wonderful testament to see people coming out to share with us so 100 has affected our lives in, in many 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 ways and i'm very grateful for that um next week's show we're gonna switch the tables a little bit we're gonna have four ladies on the show as we're gonna be focusing on our ladies this week i had four gentlemen no one can uh, sack me for that um, next week, we're going to have four ladies talking about various businesses they do. Some people you know, people like Sonia McGee, people like um, Joy, who does design, will be on the show next week. But there'll be some new people who you don't know. But I want to introduce you to an incredible young lady who's, you know, had her own personal journeys with stuff, but has turned that into an absolute positive. Um, and, and I want you guys to, to see the kind of work that other people are doing out there in the world. This is me just signing off from Facebook for now. I've already posted the Zoom details in Facebook for anybody who wants to join us now. You know we go on for a little bit longer. But once again, a public thank you to the guys who have joined me today. Thank you, Mr. President. It's been wonderful.